Okay, we started uh, last session on Thursday of last week just addressing a few thoughts about the messages that we've had uh, on uh, spiritual warfare and Satan's plan of evil and uh, recognizing that this is a spiritual battle. It is not a physical battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. In uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, it says that we're to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself uh, against the knowledge, the advanced knowledge of Christ. And what we find is that this, in fact, is a spiritual battle in its very essence and its very nature. So in, in Ephesians chapter 6, if we go to that for a few minutes, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul tells us how to be protected and how to fight uh, the enemy and the wiles of the devil, you will notice that each part of the armor that God has given us has to do with the spiritual provisions that God has given to us, and it has everything to do with truth. It has everything to do with God's word rightly divided as it is written to us and provided for us. Paul says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. So this is the way God says we are protected from the wiles, the cleverly designed schemes of the devil. And the battle and the weapons are all spiritual in nature, focused on sound doctrine. Focus on that which God has provided for us. Verse 12, for we wrestle not, and wrestling is one of the uh, most exhaustive, difficult ways to battle, and it is a wrestling, it's a tough battle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In other words, God's plan and purpose and provision is designed for us to stand, to be strong, and to withstand all of the attacks, all of Satan's policy of evil, and we can be victorious, and uh, we can be joyful, and uh, we can rejoice in the provisions that God has given us because his provisions are far greater than any, any devices, any schemes that Satan has against us. And so we are to uh, take on the whole armor of God, verse 13, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand the emphasis here over and over again as we saw last week, is that God has designed for us to stand and to rejoice. Stand, therefore, verse 14. And notice, uh, I'm just going to pick out the words that uh, are of significance, uh, not that the surrounding words are not, but only for the purpose of emphasis. There is truth, there is righteousness, there is the gospel of peace, there's faith and, uh, you know, salvation, the salvation that we have in Christ uh, as proclaimed to us in the gospel of the Apostle Paul and the word of God, the sword of the spirit and praying in the will of God, praying uh, in accord with what God has provided for us. So, uh, again, the, 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 the battle being spiritual in nature the provisions are spiritual in nature, and they're all focused upon the revelation that God has given to us specifically to live by and to fight with and to protect ourselves with. So a very positive message, very exciting to see uh, how God has made these provisions for us. 
and it doesn't go outside of these weapons and armor that God has given to us. Um, I'd like for us to turn to uh, Philippians chapter 4 because when, when you start talking about all of the wiles of the devil, all of the satanic policy of evil, when you start talking about all that Satan is doing and he is, he is the god of this world and uh, in this, the, he has control of this world, he always has right from the fall, he is the God of this world. He is the one who wants to rule in this world and does. When he offered Christ in the temptations of Christ, when he said, you bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, Christ didn't argue with him. But Christ quoted scripture rightly divided to him and said, you shall only worship the Lord your God. That's what scripture says. That's what the sword of the spirit is used to fight Satan's temptations. But Christ didn't argue with him as to about, well, he could have said, well, listen, uh, you, you don't own this world so that you can offer it to me as a reward for worshiping you. Christ knew it is stated specifically in Scripture that he's the God of this world, he's in control of this world, and all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of this world. And there's no question, it's always been like that and will continue to be that way. And uh, Satan uh, and all of his emissaries and all the ones that he's working through are focused on going against God's plan. Uh, and uh, it will culminate in the tribulation period where there's a one world government, where the Antichrist is worshiped, and where he rules the world, where believers have to flee to the mountains and, be, and, and rely on God's physical provisions as well as spiritual provisions. But the victory is in Christ. The victory is in our position in Christ. The victory is in the provisions that God has made. God consistently, through the Apostle Paul, teaches us to rejoice in the Lord always rejoice and uh, to have our thinking governed by the truths revealed to us in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4 and we see some of that. Philippians chapter 4 and uh, beginning with verse 6. Be careful or be anxious for nothing. It is not the will of God that we should live anxious and worried and fearful about what is happening in the world today. Uh, we are to stand firm. We are to rejoice. And we're to think on other things, not on everything that's going on in this world. We need to have a biblical view of what's in the world we need to have a biblical view about all of the, what Satan is doing today. But what are we to think about? What are we to focus on in our Christian life and experience? And it's all about the mind, as we'll see here in Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for nothing. Be careful for nothing. Let nothing trouble you. Nothing trouble you. Not Satan, not his emissaries, not this world, not even the physical enemies that we might have at some point because we stand for truth. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And this is the will of God for us. And the which passes all understanding it is way beyond human comfort, way beyond, beyond understanding, is the peace of God that for us. And that is what will keep and guard like a military fortress, what will guard our hearts and our minds. There it is. Our thought processes are to be captivated by doctrine 
and by the positive provisions that God has made for us. God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And now he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. In other words, he's teaching us here to think selectively. He's teaching us here to think biblically. He's teaching us here to think according to what he wants us to fill our minds with. Finally, things are true, whatever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if any praise, think on these things. And the emphasis here is on doctrine. Those things, the doctrines as described, and we can't go into detail tonight, in verse 8, it is doctrine that is true. It is doctrine that is honest. It is doctrine that is just and pure and lovely and of good report. The, those things which you have, and, and here it is. Here is the content of our thinking, what we're to fill our minds with. As we've studied many times in Romans chapter 12, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and not conform to this world. How are we renewed in our minds? Here it is, verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me. It is Paul's teaching. It is the doctrine, that body of truth, the faith, as it is described in Paul's epistles. These things do. And the God of peace with you. The God of peace will give you a peace beyond human understanding when we focus all of our attention, not part of our attention, all of our attention on sound doctrine. The word sound is literally the word health giving. Sound doctrine gives spiritual health, mental health, and strength to the spirit, to the soul, to the mind. And the God of peace shall be with you. And so the emphasis here, of course, and in many places, Paul tells us to rejoice and to think on these things and to be transformed in our minds. We have the mind of Christ in spite of the fact that all these things are going on around us. Our focus needs to be on truth. Our focus needs to be on sound doctrine. Because, as we read in 2 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, this is something that Paul told Timothy. Timothy, who was a pastor, who was a minister, uh, who was a teacher and a shepherd, the spirit of fear. There is nothing that we are to be afraid of. Nothing. Paul taught us that, not just in word, but by example. How many times do we hear of Paul's suffering, of Paul's persecutions, of Paul's tribulations, of his beatings, of uh, all that Paul endured as God's apostle for this dispensation of grace. And, uh, and he rejoiced. And he didn't let any of this sway him. And uh, here he says to Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love. And here we go again, and of a sound mind. Think on these things. Be not thou therefore ashamed of our, the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us, and so forth. So the mind is focusing on the right things. While we are aware of Satan's policy of evil, 
of his weapons, of his schemes, of his devices, of his wiles, of the fiery darts that he shoots against us. We're not to be afraid of that. We're to stand, be strong, withstand. And we do that by placing our minds, setting our minds on the things above, as Paul tells us in Colossians. Set, Colossians, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And what's going on here on the earth is all this evil and corruption, and it's not getting better. We know it's getting worse, and it's going to culminate sometime in the future on this horrible time on the earth. Nothing for us to fear. What is the absolute worst that any man can do to us? Well, kill us. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The best thing that somebody can do in, in that sense is to take our lives. What's better than to be with the Lord, to be with Christ, to be delivered from this limited, sin-cursed body and to be freed from it, to be freed from the old sin nature and to be with Christ. So the focus is always on a path, on a thought process that has to do with sound doctrine, with the provisions that God has made for us and stand on that. And we have so much to rejoice over, so much to praise God for. Uh, and so much to brag about as it relates to bragging about Christ and uh, his work on the cross and his provisions for us in the body of Christ. So uh, that is the right emphasis and the right focus. When we continue on this topic of considering the source, uh, we looked at terms of spiritual immaturity or instability, we looked at uh, you know, a, little, a little boat in the middle of a hurricane being tossed to and fro. Paul says, we cannot be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And that comes through spiritual maturity. And uh, the only thing you can do as an immature, fleshly Christian that's not governed by sound doctrine and controlled by the Spirit of God is the works of the flesh which are manifested. So the Corinthians had obviously a great problem and uh, they, they would just not listen to the right source. And uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we have evidence there that the Corinthians had problems with, um, with Paul's, with adhering to Paul's teaching and growing in Paul's teaching, they were focused on worldly things. There were evidences of carnality. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. I couldn't speak to you as mature believers who had their senses trained to do what's right and to believe what's right. But I had to speak to you as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. After all these years of being in Christ, you have not grown. In fact, quite the opposite. You're still carnal. Why? Everything to do with the word of God. Verse 2, I have failed, fed you with milk, the milk of the word of God, the basics, and not with meat. I could not give you advanced knowledge, sound doctrine, because you did not go, you did, weren't strong in the basics. The milk, no meat, because hitherto until now, uh, you have not been able to bear it, and neither, ye, neither yet now are you able. After four or five years, after Paul had left, having been there for about a year and a half, teaching them sound doctrine, they still were carnal. They still were babies who could only partake of milk, and they had a hard time digesting that, and much less meat, sound doctrine. And uh, it's been a joy to watch some Christians 
who, uh, who become a Christian and who start hungering for the Word of God and devouring every uh, teaching that they can on sound doctrine and how they can advance in a year and a half. Not the Corinthians. They had a big problem. And the problem, this carnality was manifested because they had contentions, verse 11 of chapter 3, um, it was actually chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 11. He says, For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paul, and so forth. There were contentions, fightings between them. That was an evidence of their carnality. They were just not grown up. They didn't know how to graciously deal with the problems that came to the church. As a matter of fact, they contributed to the problem by fighting with one another and causing all kinds of divisions uh, because of it, which is the next point. Uh, there's envying, strife, divisions. Go back to chapter 3. And uh, uh, Paul says, uh, verse 3 of chapter 3, For you are yet carnal, for, as, for there, whereas there is among you envyings and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? The clear teaching here is that if you were grown up, if you understood what it means to live by the grace of God and to treat each other with agape love, these contentions and divisions and strifes and envyings would disappear, would not raise their ugly head in your midst because you know how to operate by the grace of God and the teaching of God's word. And so this is the problem that you walk as mere men. You walk just like an unbeliever does, as if God had never touched your life, as if you had never had any sound teaching. And uh, these are characteristics of an immature church that never took Paul's doctrine. They never listened carefully to the source of truth for them, which is, and for us, which is what Paul taught them. So there's envying, strife, divisions. Another problem they had was a sin tolerance. They tolerated things that they absolutely should not tolerate. Chapter 5, it's reported commonly that there's immorality, fornication, actually sexual intercourse um, among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. This is so bad. You are so bad that you, you are worse than the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the pagans. They don't do this kind of thing, but you're doing it in the church, that one should have his father's wife. And the problem is you're puffed up. You are proud as an assembly. You're tolerating this. And you've not rather mourned. You've not been heartbroken over the sin tolerance in your assembly. You've tolerated things you should not. That he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. This is leaven that needs to be put away, that infects the whole assembly. And the problem is it affected the assembly. They knew about it, and they tolerated it. They laughed about it. They were proud about it. And they took it lightly. No such thing when you're a mature, grown-up Christian. There's a sin sensitivity rather than a sin tolerance. And uh, Paul says, look, you, you need to deal with this. And uh, fortunately, they did. They, respond, they responded pos positively to his teaching. In 2 Corinthians, we find this brother that is removed from their assembly because of the evil that he was doing and the sin that affected the whole assembly. And uh, he, he repents. There's a repentance and a sorrow, uh, heartbrokenness in his heart because of what he did. And the Corinthians didn't know how to deal with that. 
So they kept shunning him. And Paul says, wait, wait, take him back. Take him back. This sorrow, this repentance, this turnaround in him is cause for you to take him back, to embrace him, to encourage him, to strengthen him, and to forgive him for what he's done. But in this assembly, because of their carnality, because they never, up to this point, took Paul's teaching and appropriated it and lived by it, it, there was a sin tolerance in their assembly. There were infightings. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, Dear any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So they had all kinds of frivolous things going on, and they just ran to the law, relying on the world's law system to solve their personal problems which should have been solved in the assembly, in the context of the church. Infightings. And you can read that in the rest of these verses 1 through 8. There was, uh, they were insensitive and self-centered, which is completely the opposite of what God through Paul teaches us about what we've learned so much about, agape love. There's an insensitivity here and a self-centeredness. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, beginning with verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity, agape love, edifies, it builds up. And if any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, therefore, as concerning the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there's none other God but one. For though, they, though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there's only but one God and Father, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him, how, how be it, there's not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat, uh, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commends us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So the, the whole point here, and it goes through verse 13, is that there were, there were weak brothers and there were the strong, the mature. And, uh, you know, when it comes to eating things sacrificed to idols in that day, there were those who said, hey, I know that I can eat everything. I know there's nothing technically, literally unclean, uh, unkosher from God's point of view. He's removed all those dietary restrictions, and so we're free to do it. Not recognizing that using their liberty and using that freedom caused others to be spiritually hurt. The weak are hurt by that. It's a stumbling block to them, and Paul is teaching consistent with agape love, he's teaching that we are to restrict our freedom in order to minister to others, in order to support others in their growth and development, in order not to put in front of them a stumbling block so they stumble and get hurt spiritually. Paul teaches us to think about others better than ourselves as more important than ourselves. And so we need to, in spiritual maturity, restrict our freedom in order to minister to others, in, other, in order not to offend and become a stumbling block in the spiritual development and in the walk of a weak brother. These people, in their carnality, were insensitive and uh, self-centered. Another evidence of their carnality was their focus on infant behavior, their emphasis on spiritual gifts. You've got three chapters, chapters 12, 13, and 14, where they focused on 
things that had to do with the infancy of the church and uh, what God provided as spiritual gifts to confirm the doctrines that we are being taught. And, uh, you know, th these people focused on spiritual gifts and, and said, I have a spiritual gift that you don't, therefore I'm better than you. You don't have the spiritual gifts I have, therefore you are inferior to me. Infant, silly behavior that uh, little children uh, approach uh, in their relationships with other kids. Very selfish, very infant, very immature, and that's what you see in chapters 12, 13, and 14. And, and Paul tells us that when he was a child, he thought as a child. But now that the Word of God is complete, now that we have all of the revelation, he sets aside childish things. The Corinthians did not set aside, aside childish things. We've only touched on a few of the problems that the Corinthian church had, and, uh, and, and, and they were immature and childish and couldn't partake of spiritual meat because they were stuck on milk. They were still on the bottle when they should have been partaking of solid, the solid food of sound doctrine. Now, with all this that Paul says to the Corinthians, and he spends all these chapters rebuking them and exhorting them and try to, trying to draw them out of this childish, carnal behavior. Notice how Paul starts this epistle, this letter to them in chapter 1. Notice what he says about them. Before he goes into all of the problems that they have because of their fleshliness and carnality and refusal to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. He refers to them as the church of God. They're part of the assembly of God in the local manifestation, physical manifestation at Corinth, to them that are, he says they're sanctified. That is their position. They've been technically, I, I've created a new word for this because it comes from the word holy. They have been holified. They've been made holy by God. That's their standing before God. Holy, sanctified. In Christ Jesus, called to be saints. I mean, if, if, you, if you want to take uh, a, a sheet and begin to make check marks on people that qualify as saints, the last ones that would qualify as saints, as we define saints uh, apart from Scripture, these people would have never qualified. They were our spiritual and moral wreck. However, God brings into perspective who they are in Christ, made holy. They've been set apart. They're in Christ Jesus. They're called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace. That's exactly what they needed. It's the very thing that God through Paul's ministry has been offering in this dispensation, grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some of us may be tempted to say, when we observe all this behavior and all their rebellion against sound doctrine, we, we may not have said grace and peace unto you. We may have said, disciplined. May you be whipped for your carnality. May you suffer the consequences of all your and immaturity. That's not what Paul did. He says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you look at the Corinthians and you read and study all of the sins that are listed on this sheet. And beyond that, you analyze all that and I say, oh, what, what a disappointment you are, Corinthians. You are such a disappointment. Look at what Paul says in verse 4. 
I thank my God always on your behalf. What an attitude. What a way to look at things from heaven's point of view rather than from earth's point of view. What a way to set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on the earth. Paul says there's something greater. There's your standing in Christ. There's all that God has given to you. I thank my God always on your behalf. Why? For the grace of God which is given to you by Christ Jesus. These were clearly believers. They were members of the church, the body of Christ. God said, and Paul says, I rejoice that God, I thank God that you have been made holy, sanctified, that you have been given the, the standing of saints and uh, the grace that is given to you. Verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him. Everything enriched by him. In all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift, waiting, waiting with anticipation for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. They had this hope in him. They had this love in him. They had this truth in them. They had a standing in Christ. Verse 8 who shall also confirm you unto the end. Yeah, you're a mess right now. You, your assembly is a disaster. Not an example of what an assembly should be because of your immaturity and refusal to grow in the knowledge, the advanced knowledge of Christ by appropriating sound doctrine. Know this. You are sanctified. You've been made saints. And you know what? What God has done for you, he will do, he will complete. You're going to end well at the end in spite of the way you're living now. So get your minds, wrap your minds around that because that will change the way you live today and the way you relate to each other. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Can you believe that? Paul is saying to them, God will confirm you. God will establish you. God will get you home safely. And when you stand before God, before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, you are going to be established blameless. And the rest of the chapters, he's talking to them about how guilty they are about this carnal behavior. God is going to make you blameless. And that is the point that Paul makes. We need to think about these things. We need to think about get our heads out of the sand of the world. Get our heads out of the, the whole thinking that goes on in the world and set our minds on the things above. That's what Paul is doing here as he welcomes them in this letter, as he ministers to them in this letter, he tell, he, he's not flattering them. He is telling them the truth about their position in Christ, about what's coming, about how God is going to present them completely blameless and welcome them into heaven, into his presence, to rule and reign with him for all eternity. But as Paul does generally and specifically. Get your life consistent with who you are in Christ. Live your life consistent with the provisions that God has made for you in Christ. Get your life to be lived in harmony what is true of you in Christ. That's the constant appeal of the Apostle Paul to believers today. It's focus on Christ. Set your mind on the things above. Keep being transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have the mind of Christ. Mind these things, Paul says. And uh, those things that you have heard of me, those things which you have seen in me, those things that I've taught you, think on these things. 
because that's what's going to give you a <coughs> heavenly perspective on everything that you encounter here on this earth, whether it be personal afflictions, whether it be persecution from outside, whether it be difficulties that you experience in life, whether it's the attacks of the world, whether it's this whole system, world system, that is set against you because this world is not a friend to grace and it never will be. Don't set your mind on that. Set your mind on things above. Focus your thinking. Focus your lives on your position in Christ. That's what God has done for you. And that's where 100% of our focus must be because that's when we rejoice. That's when we have the peace of God that passes all human understanding. That's when the God of peace comes and rules in our hearts. Let the peace of Christ, Paul says in Colossians, rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ govern. Be, be the boss in your life. Be the governing rule in your life. And it comes as we set our minds on the things above. It comes as we think on these things that Paul describes in Philippians chapter 4. So the, um, the Corinthians had a huge problem in how they lived their lives in light of who they were in Christ. They had a huge blessing. And the blessing was their position in Christ and the provisions that Christ made for them and gave to them. They were filled, they were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And they needed to grow to an understanding of all of that because that would change their lives. Doctrine affects your life. Doctrine runs your life. Doctrine rules your life. And that's why we need to remain faithful to the study and proclamation of God's word because that's what equips us to live life the way God designed for us to live. There are, we've looked at terms of spiritual immaturity, but, but look at what, how Paul refers to the spiritual mature. Uh, we've seen this in our study uh, on Romans in chapter 1 and verse 11. Paul desires to give the Romans a gift, the gift of his, the doctrine that he delivers to them, so that, verse 11 of chapter 1, so that they may be established. That's a sign of spiritual maturity, being firmly established. Now, study and learn the truths of the book of Romans. This doctrine in every chapter of the book of Romans is extremely practical. It affects how you think. It affects how you live. And at the end of it all, chapter 16, verse 25, we are established. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. We need to be established. In, um, uh, and, and so then another term that Paul uses is of ma the mature. Another evidence of maturity is to be firmly grounded. And... Uh, Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 3, where he prays for the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with, we'll break in at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in earth and in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by his Spirit in the inner man, to be strengthened in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded, grounded and rooted in agape love. That's the way to live. That's the way to operate in this present evil world and in the context of the body of Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul also refers uh, about us being grounded, beginning with verse 21 of Colossians 1. And you that were at one time alienated and enemies, that's the great thing about this dispensation of grace, God 
saving those who are in enemy territory against him. We were alienated, we're enemies in our minds by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith, grounded. Our grounded, grounding and settledness is based on the faith. It's based on that body of truth that God has delivered to us through the Apostle Paul. Grounded and settled. That's spiritual maturity. That's strength. That's what Paul says in, uh, in Ephesians. Uh, go over to, actually, there's a couple of different passages. He calls it a perfect man, a mature man. Uh, in, in Gal go to Galatians first. Galatians chapter 3. And uh, here we have a problem with the Galatians because they were not holding fast to the truth that they once knew. They shifted from gr grace over to law. And by shifting from grace to law, they fell from grace. They were not able to stand in grace because, as we've said many times, you can't have one foot on law and one foot on grace. It's impossible. It's one or the other. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, the faith, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? That's what's in the context of Paul's letters. You should obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Through the teaching and preaching of the Apostle Paul, this only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? To ask the question is to answer it. You received the Spirit of God by the hearing of faith. Faith in what you heard. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect? By the flesh. Are you getting to spiritual maturity in the energy of your flesh? The answer is nope. No way. It ain't going to happen that way. It's by the Spirit of God, by living and walking, by grace through faith. Paul says in Colossians, as you therefore has received the Lord Jesus Christ, how did we receive Christ? By grace through faith. So walk ye in him. How? By grace you fa through faith, just as you received him. And uh, the Galatians here, they went back to flesh motivation, to flesh living. And that's why we have in chapter 5 the works of the flesh, all kinds of problems. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse e uh, 11. This is why God gave the gift of specific individuals who would accomplish something in the assembly. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting, the complete maturing of the saints so that they could do the work of the ministry, equipped for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and the unity of the faith. Unity, you don't have unity at any cost in the church. The only unity that counts, the only unity that God wants us to have is unity of the faith, unity in the context of the faith that has been delivered to us and of the knowledge, the advanced knowledge, the epignosis of the Son of God, unto, here we have the term again, unto a perfect man, a mature man. That's God's will for us, to, that we grow up, that we become established, firmly grounded, strengthened, to a perfect, mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Because then, from that point on, you will be no more children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine. And that's the will of God 
for us in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Truthing in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Grow up. And God has given us the word of God that does that, that builds up, that establishes believers, and that causes us to be firmly grounded and strengthened unto a perfect man, mature. And then, of course, we have in, in Galatians chapter 5, we won't go through that, the fruit of the Spirit as contrasted to the works of the flesh. You see, you're even, either manifesting the, the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. They're both inc they're incompatible. They're like two fountains. You can't have sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same fountain at the same time. The question is, who are you giving control to? Who are we allowing to control our lives and our thinking? And the Spirit of God controls our lives when the Word of God makes its way into our minds and hearts and into the way we live. That's when the Spirit of God is able to control us. It's always control consistent with the Word of God, the teaching of God's Word. We have done much study through Steve's, Steve Walker's teaching on agape love. That's the manifestation that uh, needs to be in the assembly. Love, agape love, is everywhere in Paul's epistles. It is the, the fruit of the Spirit. It is the way we operate with one another. We don't operate with fleshly motivations, selfish ambitions. We're motivated and driven by the, the love of God, agape love. And that love is what compels us to live for him who died and rose again and not live for ourselves, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So that's what's important. That's what's critical about considering the source. Be careful who you listen to. We've got to listen to our apostle, the apostle Paul, and the doctrine that God has given to us through him. And there's no choice about it. Anything else does not establish and strengthen and lead to spiritual maturity and to behaving the way God wants us to behave in the church. That's the optimum. That's the ultimate. That's the manifestation of the love of God, the hope that we have in Christ, the, the, the uh, faith that has been delivered to us. That's what manifests to each other and... Uh, is a testimony to this world and, yes, even to the angelic community who we minister to. We minister to them. And God displays his grace through us to the angelic community as we read in the book of Ephesians. So be careful who you listen to. Consider the source. Always adhere to sound doctrine. Think on these things. And... Uh, then you will be strong and established. And that's what will protect you from every wind of doctrine, things that come and go. Stay stable, strong, solidly anchored in the Word of God. And that's what's critical as we live for Christ and walk with Him. All right, let's pray together.